All right, hello everybody and welcome to this week's policy and advocacy training for the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. We really appreciate you all joining us um, and are so excited to have our speakers here today talking about the role of existing rules and laws. Uh, I'm going to start off by asking everyone to make sure you keep yourself on mute during the conversation unless you have a question, at which point please feel free to use the raise hand function or comment in the chat and we can either unmute you or read your question aloud. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Please remember, if you are watching these sessions after the fact, send me an email and let me know because we'll count your participation that way. And at the Indigenous Connectivity Summit next week, we'll be giving out certification um, certificates and I really wanna make sure that we're not missing anybody. So I'll send another email with that information too, but just let me know if you're, you're watching these. One other thing to keep in mind, next week's session is going to be at a different time than this week's session. It's a part of the Indigenous Connectivity Summit itself, and so we need to shift a little bit to fit in with the regular agenda. So I'll update the calendar invitation, but please make sure that you are aware of that um, and that you don't join at this time next week because we will not be here. So I'll send all that in an email and I'll say it again at the end for anyone who's just now joining. Um, but with that, again, huge thank you to our speakers today. We're really looking forward to it. And I will turn it over to Blair Anderson. And you should be able to see my slides now, correct? All right, thank you for that. Um, my name is Claire Anderson, and I am a commissioner at the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunication Commission. I am a regional commissioner, and I am the commissioner for British Columbia and Yukon. I am also a member of the Taku River Clinket First Nation in northern British Columbia. Our traditional territory is in the very northern part of British Columbia, and it also extends into Yukon and Alaska. And I'm really happy to be here today to give a general presentation about the kind of work that the CRTC is doing. And I'm also really happy that two of my colleagues are joining me today. Uh, one of them, Ian Bagley, is going to be doing some of the presentation with me. Ian is a director in our telecom sector. And specifically, he's the, general, he's the director general for the Broadband Fund. So I've enlisted his assistance to present some slides on the Broadband Fund. Um, because he's got tremendous insight. And I'm also happy to introduce one of my colleagues, Commissioner Ellen Desmond. Um, Commissioner Desmond was appointed to the CRTC, I guess it was just in June of this year, and she is the Commissioner for the Atlantic Region and for Nunavut. And so I'm really happy that she's able to observe the presentation today. Um, she's got a really impressive history, um, particularly in administrative law. And uh, let's see, she was designated at Queen's Council in 2015. And like I said, she's a regional commissioner for Atlantic provinces and Nunavut. So um, thank you, um, first of all, for inviting me to be here. And thanks to my colleagues for attending this presentation with me. I'm really excited to get going. So... I am just trying to find my notes. Sorry. Sorry, Katie. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to see my notes. Is there a way? Let's see. Are they? So they should be open. If you have them open on your screen, then I'll keep up just this version without the notes on mine. Right. Um, okay, so here we go. Yeah. So uh, first I will be talking a bit about what the CRTC does. Second, I will discuss communications in Canada. Third, I'll review some CRTC processes that might be of interest to you. And finally, I will go through how the CRTC engages with Canadians. So, the CRTC is an administrative tribunal that operates at arm's length from the federal government to regulate and supervise the communications industry in the public interest. We're dedicated to ensuring that Canadians have access to a world-class communication system. 
The commission was created in 1968 to regulate broadcasting and then telecom was added to our mandate in the 1970s. We report to the Parliament, to Parliament through the Minister of Canadian Heritage. The CRTC is focused on achieving policy objectives established in the Broadcasting Act, the Telecommunication Act, and Canada's anti-spam legislation. The Broadcasting Act has a number of policy objectives that include providing a wide range of high quality programming that reflects Canadian attitudes, opinions, ideas, and values, displays Canadian talent, and also recognizes the special place of Indigenous people within our society. The Telecommunications Act contains the Canadian telecommunications policy that has multiple objectives, including to facilitate the orderly development throughout Canada of a telecommunication system that serves to safeguard, enrich, strengthen, and strengthen the social and economic fabric of Canada and its regions. Our anti-spam legislation is to protect Canadians from online threats and to ensure a secure online marketplace so that businesses can compete. And then finally, the CRTC Act is the legislation that establishes our commission as a whole and talks about its general composition and powers. So although the CRTC is an independent organization, the Telecommunications Act sets out that the government can provide policy directions to the CRTC. The policy directions formally and transparently lay out the government's priorities for telecommunications policy, and they provide a general policy direction that guide us in making our decisions. So cabinet has sent two policy directions to the commission to achieve the policy objectives. One was sent in 2006 and the second one was in 2019. The 2006 policy direction instructs the Commission to rely on market forces to the maximum extent possible to achieve our policy objectives. The policy direction requires that the Commission take a market-based approach to implementing the Telecommunications Act. The 2019 policy direction instructs that the Commission should consider how its decisions can promote competition, affordability, consumer interests and innovation, and in particular, consider the extent to which our decisions encourage competition, foster affordability and lower prices, particularly when service providers exercise market power, ensure affordability in all regions in Canada, enhance and protect the rights of consumers, reduce barriers to entry into the market, enable innovation and stimulate investment and research. So the commission consists of a chairperson, two vice chairpersons, and up to 10 regional commissioners. The regional commissioners bring the views of our respective provinces and territories to the commission. Stakeholders can meet with staff and commissioners, but cannot discuss any open files with us. And in addition, stakeholders must comply with the Lobbying Act with respect to designated public office holders. So just for clarification, the chair, the vice chair, and some senior level management are considered public office holders under our Lobbying Act. The commissioners are not public office holders. So the commission decisions are all made um, in light of the objectives from the legislation as well as the policy directions I discussed. But in addition, the decisions that we make must be made based on the public record only. Outside information cannot be used. So interested parties are encouraged to support their views using research, evidence, or other relevant information. And this is to ensure pre procedural fairness is afforded to all parties. And the duty of procedural fairness is to ensure that administrative decisions are made using a fair and open procedure. So this next section talks a little bit about the importance of technology. Technology has become essential in every part of our life, whether it's health, education, safety, security, or economic opportunity. Um, the next few slides are going to highlight some very high level trends in Canada. Most of the data is from 2018 or 2019. Um, so here we go. 
This slide pertains to wireless technology and really it discusses the fact that Canada's wireless networks reach 99% of Canadians and serve over 34.4 million subscribers. LTE or 4G networks are widely available across Canada and over the next few years service providers will be continuing to upgrade to 5G. And this slide pertains to internet. So preliminary data from 2019 indicates that 87% of Canadian households have access to fixed broadband internet services with at least 50 megabit per second download, 10 megabit per second upload with unlimited data, which we'll speak about those numbers um, in a slide that's coming up fairly soon. So um, data from 2018 indicates that 31% of First Nations households, households on reserve have access to this 5010 speed. This next section of the presentation will provide an overview of the CRTC's key activities as they relate to broadband. So I'm going to ask my colleague Ian Bagley to speak to these slides. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Um, if I could just do a quick sound check, if somebody could just raise your hand if you can hear me and then I'll continue to make sure I can be heard. Perfect. You're good to go. I'll take a thumbs up instead. It's all good. Thank you very much. So yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Yes, as, as I had uh, as mentioned off the top, I'm the Director General for the uh, Broadband Fund, among a few other things in the telecommunications sector here at, the, here at CRTC. I joined uh, just a little under three years ago, and I came specifically, uh, uh, what, what interested me the most about the regulator was, was to come and, and help implement the Broadband Fund, because it is a, a new it's a new uh, program for the Commission. Certainly not for the federal government, but but as an arm's length regulator, this is our first foray into this area. So before I talk about the broadband fund, um, I think I'll talk just a little bit about, should be on slide 12, uh, looking at the universal service objective. And, and before I get into that, I think I'll just back up a little bit and talk a bit of basic service and what that has meant historically and what it what it means today. So one of the key roles of the Commission is to ensure that Canadians have access to uh, world-class communication systems. And this goes back well over 20 years when, when uh, the Commission introduced the notion of basic service back when that was uh, largely telephony based. So they defined basic service to mean uh, landline um, home phone service along with a, so local service along with access to a long distance plan as well as some uh, access to long distance competition. Uh, some smart uh, smart touch uh, features, uh, all at affordable rates. So this notion of, of, of basic service goes back well into the 90s. And on top of uh, ensuring that there's both an obligation to serve uh, these basic services to the incumbent local service providers, um, there's also uh, price caps in place as well as a local subsidy. So the notion of a local subsidy is important. So um, as we get into the broadband fund, so very quickly without boring people with, uh, with the math, we. Uh, the commission um, puts a very small levy. It's a small uh, percentage of eligible revenue from the top service providers across the country. Uh, we collect that every year. In the past, it's been used to help subsidize uh, local phone service, basic service, um, uh, and very high cost rural remote areas across the country. So that's that's a somewhat important concept because it's a, as you know, obviously things have evolved over time. So uh, people rely less and less on, on landline telephones. Rely more on broadband internet, not just for personal use, but to, to, to uh, compete effectively in the digital economy. And of course, uh, strong reliance on mobile phones, smartphones, and associated data with all of those things. So uh, back in 2016, through a, through a public process, the CRTC expanded its definition of basic telecommunication service to include broadband internet, as well as mobile wireless services and uh, at the same time set a universal service objective. And that is to have all Canadians having access to speeds of 50 megabits per second download and 10 megs upload, as well as an uh, access to an unlimited, un unlimited data option, I should say, as well as to ensure that homes and businesses have access to the latest generally deployed mobile wireless technology, which uh, today we're, we're, we're leveraging. It's LTE, which is just marketing speak for long-term evolution or, or 4G mobile service, um, as not just in their communities, but also along major routes. So um, the, the intent is for 
all Canadians, we're, we, the first goalpost is uh, by the end of 2021, we'd like to see 90% of all Canadians having access to the universal service objective or USO level of service. And ultimately we'd like to see by the year, no later than the year 2030, uh, having 100% of Canadians at that level of service. So clearly we, we can't do this alone. This is going to be, um, you know, this is going to require investment from federal, provincial, municipal levels, as well as from private and nonprofit organizations, which I'll get into a little bit later. But in any event, the, 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 the um, expanding of the definition of basic service, as well as the establishment of the USO are, uh, are key to uh, the impetus to creating the broadband fund. So on slide 13, I'll talk just a little bit about the broadband fund. So with basic service now expanded and the USO in place, the broadband fund is how the CRTC is now proposing to do its part. So just like in the past, we have subsidized local telephone service. We're now instead are going to um, help expand basic service and achieve the USO through the implementation of our broadband fund. As we do this, we are ramping down the, the, uh, the local subsidy at the same time because this largely is being uh, funded by the same service providers that were uh, providing basic service uh, for, for, long, for, for local phone service in the past. So one is going down, the other is ramping up. So in broad strokes, it is a $750 million fund over five years. Uh, it's intended uh, to complement future public funding and private investments so um, many of you probably will have heard of Canadian federal um, broadband funds in the past through uh, the department that used to be called Industry Canada is now Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. They too will soon be larging, uh, launching their own uh, renewed fund uh, shortly. And uh, you may well be aware of many other provincial uh, funding programs out there. So um, it will take approximately six or so billion dollars to close the digital divide and help have every Canadian have access to USO level service. Um, so certainly $750 million goes a long way, but it certainly doesn't uh, fully close the gap. So it's going to require concerted effort from across the board. Um, it, it, it is, so clearly the money is collected from the telecommunications industry. So that's important to note. So it's not technically a government program per se. And up to 10% will be provided to satellite dependent communities and projects that will help benefit satellite dependent communities, which I'll touch on uh, briefly on the next slide. So just a little bit about the broadband fund itself. Um, we launched our first call for applications about a year ago, and that focused on the, uh, the Yukon, Northwest Territories and, and Nunavut, as well as all satellite uh, dependent communities across Canada. Um, we had that first call closed uh, in, in October, and we just announced our first funding, um, pro first funded projects from that initial call um, uh, quite recently in August of this past year. I'll touch on that on, uh, on the next slide. Uh, we then held in November of last year, um, our second call for applications, which is um, across Canada. It includes the same regions that were covered in the first call, but the focus is now national in scope uh, for all types of projects. And um, yeah, we received just under 600 applications. So uh, we'll be kept busy for, for quite some time. And they're, they're seeking at the fund is 750 million. And we currently have a one and a half billion dollars sought from our program. So we'll be, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be busy. Um, a little bit about the structure of the fund. It's, it uses a comparative selection approach. Um, it goes back a little bit to Claire's point on procedural fairness and having to have open and transparent processes. This means we've had to have fairly rigorously defined uh, criteria within the fund. So we, we first look at eligibility criteria, assessment uh, criteria, and then there are selection considerations as well. So I'll briefly touch on, the, on these. Um, so in order to even be eligible for funding, there's certain eligibility criteria that have to be met, including things like community consultation. We, we, we look at that as a, an assessment criteria for sure, but you can't, you're not even eligible unless you've demonstrated that you've, you've consulted with the community that you're looking to serve. There are various applicant eligibility criteria as well. So you have to be a corporation or an NGO uh, or a band council or a consortium of those three. Um, at least one of the members of that consortium has to have experience in building and maintaining broadband networks, uh, have to demonstrate they're financially solvent. There's eligibility criteria surrounding the types of projects we'll accept. So this would be either local access projects for broadband, uh, this would be transport projects, satellite projects or mobile projects as well. It's a whole host of eligible and, and ineligible costs that we'll consider. 
as well as geographic areas, et cetera. So once all of these uh, various eligibility criteria have been met, we then look at all eligible projects and we assess them against one another and against the uh, assessment criteria that exists. And so there are a few assessment criteria that apply to all projects. So uh, for example, technical merit, level of community consultation, financial viability, as well as uh, level of funding from other sources. Those are things that we look at from for all projects. And then we have different assessment criteria in place depending on the project type. So if it's an access project, for example, we'll look at the gap between the existing service and the USO. We'll look at the subsidy cost per household as an example. If it's a mobile project, we'll look at um, the level of improvement service of improved service uh, proposed, uh, et cetera. And then transport, we look at things like um, a number of points of presence, um, number of communities and households served, open access offered, et cetera. So once we've gone through that, we will have identified a subset of high quality projects. And then we make our funding recommendations to the, to the commissioners and there are various selection considerations that commissioners can, can use when they're choosing which projects to fund. So uh, once, um, so the, the, in all cases, um, the commission will, will, will consider the efficient use of funds because we have limited funds and demands that significantly exceed what we have to give out. And they may consider, um, for example, whether the project will serve an indigenous community or uh, communities of, of, that are deemed to be official language minority communities. Um, we, they may consider multiple regions across Canada. They may prioritize access over transport projects and, sorry, transport over access projects, I should say. And they may consider um, an access or transport project over mobile. And all of these criteria were established through uh, public processes and now form the record upon which we build our, our funds. So just conscious of time, uh, moving on to, to the last slide, just to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we have awarded. Um, so yeah, you can see, you know, even just coming out of that first call, we received 15 applications and we've awarded um, funding to just five projects. And yet that already accounts for 70 to $72 million of funding that we are proposing. It'll, but with the good news is it'll benefit over 10,000 households and 51 communities. It's a combination of, there's a few fiber projects, a couple of fiber projects that we're, we're announcing. So. Uh, the biggest ticket ones would be um, one is going to Northwest Tel and Yukon that will, for just under $40 million, it'll benefit 19 communities um, and just uh, just under 5,000 households. We have a similar fiber project for just under $17 million in Yukon, also to Northwest Tel. That will benefit 18 communities and approximately 3,600 households. And then there's three satellite projects. So uh, one to broadband communication north incorporated um, that will be in northern Manitoba and will deliver um, speeds of 10-1. Uh, we understand that's below the USO but we have made a provision for satellite projects understanding they won't necessarily be able to get to the 50-10 USO speeds with the existing technology. Um, pleased to say that the two other satellite projects that we have approved, one in north, uh, both going to Northwest Tel, one for a community in Yukon and, and another for eight communities in Northwest, uh, Northwest Territory, uh, those will eventually deliver uh, 50 10 speeds, uh, thanks in large part to uh, what once the LEO or low Earth orbit satellite technology becomes available, um, they will uh, benefit from that as well too. So it's me doing a lot of speaking, but very happy to, to see that we've been able to get this much funding out. And we are currently um, actively assessing all call two applications. Um, it, I should note that obviously if we're talking about uh, indigenous communities, that there, there were certain projects that were submitted in the first call, including those for uh, the territory of Nunavut that have been deferred to the second call for applications because they're satellite projects. And as I mentioned a little earlier, we've got a 10% maximum cap uh, out of the 750 million that's set aside for satellite. So we felt it was prudent to take a look, take a look at the call two satellite projects uh, together it's a, we may have done two calls, but it's a single fund. So we need to we need to look at the total demand for satellite funding. So those are currently under assessment, as well as all of the other call to uh, projects as well. So that's it for me. I've probably gone way over my allocated time, but uh, but thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, your insight is always extremely appreciated, and it's very valuable. So thank you for that. 
Um, another process that I thought everybody might be interested in is a recent process that was launched in December of 2019, and it was with respect to barriers to deployment. So we were seeking a call for comments regarding potential barriers to deploying broadband capable networks in underserved areas in Canada. So this review complements the broadband fund as it seeks to facilitate infrastructure builds through regulatory measures that could reduce and potentially even eliminate the need for additional funding. We extended the call for comments until July of this year, and we are now just reviewing the interventions. Um, because it's an open file, we're not at liberty to comment too much about it, uh, which is something that you'll notice throughout uh, the presentation. Again, this goes back to procedural fairness and having to make decisions based on the record that's in front of us and not wanting to give any party unfair advantages. Um, so. Um, anyway, uh, the information that we're able to provide is part of the presentation, so I'll just go on to the next slide. Another process that I thought might be of interest is the Internet Code. Uh, this came into force in January of this year, and it applies to the larger Internet service providers in Canada. It protects Canadians who subscribe to Internet services. These services are more important than ever right now in our daily lives, and Canadians have the right to know um, the information that's in their contracts. And so part of what the code does is it ensures that contracts are in easy to read language. Um, it also has some provisions about bill shock protection. So um, essentially having notifications when customers approach their data usage limits um, and just having clearer information about prices, including bundles, uh, time limited discounts and whatnot. Um, this is administered through the Commission for Complaints for Telecom and TV Services, CCTS, and that's an independent organization that oversees the implementation of the code. So while CRTC generally doesn't regulate for retail prices for telecommunication services in Canada, there's an important exception. In, 20, in 2007, the CRTC established a price cap regulatory framework for Northwest Tel, and since then, the Commission has regulated the prices of a number of retail and wholesale services, including internet services. We will soon be launching a review for the regulatory framework for Northwest Tel, and Northerners, as well as all interested parties, will have an opportunity to submit their views on this regulatory framework. Um, and I'm going to explain how you can participate in CRTC public proceedings in a moment. So the CRTC actively engages with Canadians in order to better understand their needs within the communication system. To do this, the CRTC consults with and informs the public through its notices of consultation. It responds to inquiries and complaints from the public. It collaborates with domestic and international partners on issues and it facilitates industry co-regulation and self-regulation through consultations, committees, and working groups. So the, CRC, excuse me, the CRTC makes its decisions based on a public record. The more views on the public record, the better. So we encourage you to participate and engage. And there are several ways that you can do this. You can participate in notices of consultation by sending your ideas, your comments, your opinions, to the Commission by submitting an intervention online or in writing. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide, there's a URL that uh, lists all of our notices of consultation. So you can take a look at what notices of consultation are open right now. We also have public hearings. That's another public proceeding, which are meetings where people can voice their opinions on a specific topic to a panel of commissioners. A hearing is often used um, to deliberate major policy considerations, whether it's telecom or broadcasting, and you can send in written comments or you can also make a request to speak at a hearing. Um, and you can request to appear via Skype and we've made accommodations previously for people that require accommodations, for instance, um, sign language interpreters. Uh, the CRTC also conducts public opinion research, so we conduct surveys and focus groups for specific issues so that we can obtain quantitative and qualitative data. And then we also carry out public engagement and online consultation through social media channels. And so under this section on social media, I've, we've listed um, some of our specific channels, uh, like our Facebook handles and our Twitter handles. 
And then finally, the public can reach us between 8.30 and 4.30 Eastern time by phone. We've got a consumer support center that's also open during those hours. And um, we're here to listen to the public and hear feedback on their experience as consumers as well. So here's our contact information. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or comments. And um, as a commissioner, I'm not exactly an engineer or a technician, but if there's ever any information that I'm not able to provide, um, what I can do is refer you to or connect you to a colleague that may be in a better position to answer your questions. Um, I'll say it one last time, we're not able to talk about open files because of procedural fairness issues, but um, I'd, I'd like to engage with Canadians as much as I can. And so we welcome any questions or comments that you may have. Shall I end the slideshow? Sure, yes, and I'll go ahead and, and stop my screen share. Um, Commissioner Anderson and, and Ian, we are so grateful to you all for being here and for that presentation. That was really great. And you may have seen, you've got a ton of questions in the chat, so we can kind of run through some of those, though I know that there are all sorts of considerations on how you answer these questions. Um, it looks like you've got some questions about terrestrial, fixed fiber, in addition to mobile, some questions about the maps, questions about market forces. And so I don't know if you have the chat open and if you'd like to go through them or if you'd like me to read them out loud for you. Um, I'm just opening it right now. But did you want to start asking questions and then we can do our best to answer? Perfect. That sounds good to me. And I'm for those that are putting questions in, um, please do continue to put those in there. I'm just going to run through the ones that I've I see top to bottom. Um, so first thing I saw, Danae Wilson asked if the 30% on reservations, if it was 30% on reservations that are connected, I think maybe yeah. Mark answered that and said, yes, it's the neighborhood of 31%. Is that correct? It is. I think it's 31.3% 31, 31 of First Nation households on reserve, which um, I'm guessing you're noticing is quite a bit lower than households that aren't on reserve. That information, I believe, is on our 2019 communications monitoring report, and so that's data from 2018. So I'm not sure if it's if, if there would be changes to be made if it was brought up to date, but that is the most recent data that we have. Thank you. And then, kind of in that same vein, um, Joel Templeman asks, "Do you know why the maps are based on those hexagonal 25?" kilometer shapes as opposed to based on individual residents or businesses? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah sure, no problem. Um, well, yeah, it, that would have been determined part of as, as part of the public process. That's a good question. We've got a lot of feedback on that, but um, that would have been determined as part of the public process when we consulted on the, on the broadband fund. Um, I can't speak to the back and forth on the record because it would have probably predated me joining, but I, I do know that uh, the, the biggest game in town from a federal gun, uh, government funding perspective has been um, the department I said, as I said before, and they had standardized that same 25 uh, kilometer hex um, as a standard. So uh, there's a bunch of reasons that beyond what's in the public record, it it's logistically makes sense for us to, to leverage the same thing, at least for the first two calls that we, uh, that we did in terms of what it might look like in the future. That's of course, subject to a future, uh, Future consideration. I know that I said is considering getting down to a more granular level, getting down to the pseudo household level for their future calls and all sorts of other neat innovations. But uh, at least for our calls, we uh, we standardized on what was in place uh, already. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next, we had a question about the CRTC oversight and if there is a backstory as to why Heritage Canada is the entity that houses the CRTC. Um, I actually am not sure about that background information, but in terms of trying to merge that portfolio or uh, shuffle it over to ICED's jurisdiction, I assume that would be a, a government decision and not up to the commission. But um, Ian, I, I don't know if you know the answer about why we report to Heritage. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all kind of uh, new, new to the commission. I, I suspect it has to do with the cultural component more more closely associated with the broadcasting side of the CRTC would be my guess, but 
uh, Commissioner Anderson is correct, that would be a government decision as to, how, to, to whom we would report through Parliament. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've got one participant named Cherish who asks, is there a plan for Atlin, British Columbia? It's close to the Yukon border. I think that this question came when you were talking about the broadband funds. I'm not sure if that's one of the, Cherish, if you want to clarify, um, or if Commissioner Anderson, you have some information about plans for Atlin. Um, well, certainly the universal service objective is an objective that we would like all Canadians to be able to subscribe to, and that's all Canadians are entitled to have an internet download speed of 50 megabits per second and an upload speed of 10 um, and unlimited data packages everywhere. Um, like Ian had mentioned in his presentation, we do have a broadband fund, which was $750 million over a five year period to distribute. And that's obviously not gonna be enough money for all communities. Um, the first wave um, of projects or the first wave of funding was intended to go to territories or satellite dependent communities. And I understand that that's not the case with Atlan, but the second wave was open to all different areas. Um, so yeah, it is going to take um, funding from multiple different entities from all levels of government, as well as from the private sector and NGOs. Um, and um, that's, I think, all that I can say really uh, about that matter. Ian, did you have anything else that you would maybe suggest? No, no, you captured it. It's um, th there could very well be applications that do touch uh, that particular community, but we can't discuss any applications that have been received. So, you're right. It could, it could be a matter of reaching out to the service provider in the area, um, local government, provincial government. Um, again, it's a group effort. Thank you. All right, then we've got three questions from Sally, Kathy, Trevor, with some support from Joel that all essentially are asking about um, what exactly it means to talk about market for forces when CRTC says that that's driving their policy. How does that impact um, individuals? And how does a CRT help, CRTC help to promote those positive market forces? I hope I'm summarizing those correctly for those that wrote the questions. Okay. Um, I really, I do think that the 2019 policy directive or policy direction did clarify how the 2006 direction should have been interpreted. So I think it's helpful to read both of them together because the 2019 policy direction does refer to the earlier direction in its recitals. Um, but it does clarify it by providing specific and unique considerations by trying to reduce barriers to entry to the uh, market, uh, specifically in reference to smaller players. So I think that that's a helpful direction. Um, but again, these are directions that are coming from government to us. Um, Ian, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share about, about this? Yeah, well, and, and just I'm trying to read the questions because I think there was probably a lot there to unpack. So yeah, the barrier to broadband deployment um, uh, proceeding that you're talking about that does touch on quite a bit of the the uh, market forces uh, to enabling the sharing of uh, shareable passive infrastructure. So there was a question specific to towers, buildings, conduit, fiber. That would that would all be in scope of that proceeding. So how do we do that? We would launch we would launch proceedings just like the one uh, that, that uh, Commissioner Anderson spoke to earlier. So that's one way in which we do it. Um, speaking in platitudes a bit here, you, you typically you want to allow market, market forces to do their thing. We, that's, and it's been largely a, a, a doing what we can to promote competition, facilities-based competition in order for there to be sufficient market forces to ensure a high level of service and affordability across the country. So a light touch regulatory approach, but uh, intervening when and where necessary. For example, as again, as Claire had mentioned earlier, um, one notable exception being Northwest Tel, where we do actually regulate retail rates for things like internet, et cetera, where there's insufficient uh, or perception of at least uh, in a lot of the territories, insufficient competition. So it, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how we tackle these, th these things. It depends on where and when, but it's, um, it's, it's a combination of, of uh, regulation or, or imposing tariffs where, where market forces are, don't exist or insufficient, uh, otherwise 
promoting competition so that market forces can help define the uh, the Canadian competitive landscape and then holding proceedings. Um, as we currently are, where we can see that there might be a bit of a gap and, and something like 5G is coming down the, the down the pipe, that's exactly why, you know, looking ahead, this is why we're gonna hold certain proceedings like we are now. Absolutely, thank you both. So um, for all of our participants, we've got a couple minutes left before we move to the next um, panelist. And I know that there are a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm gonna ask maybe one or two more. Um, but one thing I really wanna make sure I emphasize as well is that the last two years that we have created the policy recommendations as an outcome of, of the Indigenous Connectivity Summit, one of the number one things that participants have said is that they hope that there would be more um, consultation and communication between government and participants or, or community representatives. So if you have questions specifically about how to get involved in these processes, how to communicate with government or to be a part of that consultation process, I would really encourage you to write them in the chat. Um, and if we can't answer them right now, I hope that Commissioner Anderson and Ian, if you all don't mind you know, giving some information on that in response, that would be great in the chat. Um, but you know, that has been an ongoing theme for years with, with these summits and this is a great opportunity to answer your questions about how to get involved. Um, so one question that I think will be interesting to both our US and Canadian participants is how did the CRTC arrive at the 50-10 goal for speed? Because in the US, it's quite a bit lower and it'd be great to know um, what sort of evidence you all use that maybe we can pitch here as well. Uh, I'm assuming you want me to, to jump in probably. Um, again, it's uh, just going back on the record because I was, I was just joining the commission when this had already been established. The Universal Service Objective of 50-10 came out in 2016 and I joined in December 2017, but having read it, it's, it would have, again, it would have come, come through public consultation. So CRTC does everything. All of its decisions are based on what's on the public record. So it would have, would have been a notice. There would have been interventions from uh, across industry and interested parties across the country. Um, the 5010 was deemed to be the, the minimum speed necessary to be delivering the, some of the critical applications needed. Um, whether it be remote learning, whether it be participating in the digital economy, uh, ability to do uh, things like uh, real-time gaming, uh, like that, that seems like a, not so much of a competitive or an, an economic driver, but it's a quite a high standard that can be used as an example. I, I can point you to, uh, I think there's some links in the presentation that go in depth into the 2016 decision if you'd like to uh, examine how we landed exactly on the 5010, but the shorter answer is it would have come through consultation with, with the public. And, and with what was on the public record and what was deemed to be necessary to, uh, minimum necessary to achieve uh, truly high speed service. Yeah, thank you for that. And what I'll do is I'll try to post a link to that policy decision. That's the 2016 policy decision where we arrived at that as the USO, I believe. Is that right, Ian? So that's available. Yeah. And I believe, yeah. I believe the record might also be available as well if anyone ever wanted to um, take a look at the submissions that were in front of the commission at the time. Um, it was before before both of our times at the commission. But yeah, it's uh, definitely interesting read. And in terms of what happens in the future, um, I'd say your guess is as good as mine. But we're not really at liberty to disclose any information that's not made public. So um, we can give you the information about um, why the 5010 was selected because it's in the policy direction or the policy decision. So I'll do that right now. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, and thank you both again for your time and for this presentation. This has been really helpful and I appreciate you answering so many of the questions in the chat as well. Um, Commissioner Anderson and Ian, if you all have time to respond to some of the additional ones I didn't get to, please feel free to. But all keep in mind that those contact details were on the last slide of the presentation as well, which will be available after this. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Katie. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. All right. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sayuri. Katie, thank you. Um, could you, I think you have to give me host ability again to share my screen. Let's see. I have it. There you go. There you go. Okay, is it visible? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. Okay. 
slideshow mode. Okay. It tells me things. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sairi Rajapaksa, and I'm Deputy Chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy at the Federal Commission, Communications Commission. Uh, we are often known by our um, acronym ONAP. I'd also like to mention that Derek Goatson, a new legal advisor in ONAP, is also on this call. And I would like to begin today by thanking the Internet Society for inviting me to be here. I want to start by talking a bit about the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to provide you with some background information about its mission, governance, and structure, its regulatory authority and the rulemaking process, and especially how the Commission takes in public input. I will briefly discuss the Universal Service Fund through which the Commission provides support for affordable nationwide service. I'll then touch on ONAP's role the work of our Native Nations Communications Task Force and provide an overview of some current proceedings, especially some of the actions the Commission took to respond to the pandemic. The FCC is an independent government agency overseen by Congress. Its mission includes implementing and enforcing America's communications law and regulations, regulating interstate and international communications by wire and radio in all 50 states, D.C., and U.S. territories, and covering wireline and wireless services, satellite, broadcast TV and radio, and cable TV. There are five commissioners, uh, no more than three from the same political party. The president selects the chair, currently Ajit Pai. The commission is divided into a series of bureaus and offices, and I would note that the Office of Native Affairs and Policy is part of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. The FCC establishes and enforces rules based on the substantive areas outlined in the Communications Act, which broadly mirrors the agency's bureau organization. So for example, wireline, wireless, and media. The FCC also adopts rules and policies administered by certain outside agencies and entities rather. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Universal Service Administrative Company or USAC, which administers Universal Service Fund programs and funding. Rulemaking is the process for developing and issuing rules and regulations. Once adopted, these rules and regulations establish the framework governing providers, including wireline and wireless services. A top priority of FCC rulemaking activity is closing the digital divide and promoting broadband deployment nationwide, including on tribal land. This slide on public input is an important one, I think, for the audience. For those of you not familiar with the notice and comment rulemaking process, the FCC depends on public comment to evaluate proposals and provide record support for rules. The record is public to promote transparency. The FCC wants widespread input and different perspectives, including from tribal nations and entities. The public can provide comment in written form or through in-person meetings, so the substance of those meetings must then be summarized in public ex parte filings. Written comments and ex parte filings can be made and accessed through the FCC's electronic comment filing system, or ECFS. And I want to stress that a comment can be a simple statement on tribal letterhead, and also that ONAP stands ready to help with any questions about how to file. This slide gives a simple overview of Universal Service Fund basics. There's much more material about the USF, as it's referred to, on the FCC's website. Briefly, universal service, the availability of affordable, reliable telecommunications service nationwide, is a fundamental component of the federal communications law. In broad terms, contributions flow from covered telecom providers into the four programs, high cost, mm -hmm. lifeline, E-rate, and rural health care. And funding is then distributed to eligible entities to reduce the cost of service. Some of the proceedings I'll be discussing later on involve funding from these universal service programs. This slide sets out um, ONAP's mission. 
um, as I mentioned, I'm part of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. We're a fairly young office, having been created about a decade ago. And we are part of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, as I said. So our mission is uh, laid out here. Uh, it is to ensure robust government-to-government -government consultation with federally recognized tribal governments, working within the commission, as well as with other government agencies and private organizations to develop and implement policies for assisting Native communities, ensuring Native concerns and voices are considered in all relevant commission proceedings and initiatives, and representing the commission's position on matters of interest to tribal entities. ONAP is responsible for managing the Commission's Native Nations Communications Task Force. This iteration of the task force was formed in November 2018. It has 24 tribal members and eight FCC members who are largely senior staff representing the Bureau. For example, my fellow FCC presenter, Jim Schlichting, is the representative to the task force from the International Bureau. The tribal co-chair is Danae Wilson of the Nez Perce Tribe, who I believe is on today's call. The FCC co-chair is Matthew Duchesne, Chief of ONAP. The task force is tasked with providing guidance, expertise, and recommendations on issues affecting tribal governments and people. Its input is intended to inform and advance the Commission's efforts to close the digital divide affecting Indian country, among all other policy objectives. A report from the tribal members of the Native Nations Communications Task Force entitled Improving and Increasing Broadband Deployment on Tribal Lands was adopted in November 2019 and posted in December. It highlights tribal success stories and provides potential solutions for policymakers that could benefit residents of Indian Country. I highly recommend reviewing it. It's available on our website, which is FC, well, sorry, www.fcc dot gov, G-O-V, forward slash native. I'll say that one more time. www.fcc.gov forward slash native. In my last minutes, I wanted to highlight a few of the recent proceedings and initiatives that I think might be of interest to this audience. I have to emphasize that this list is not meant to be comprehensive. ONAP sends out email blasts regularly to keep our tribal contacts informed about the work of the commission. Please contact us if you'd like to receive those messages. We're happy to add you to our list. I'm sure that some of you are familiar with the 2.5 gigahertz rural tribal priority window. It was a first of its kind opportunity for federally recognized tribes to obtain licenses to unassigned mid-band spectrum over their rural tribal lands. The window was scheduled to run from February 3rd, 2020 to August 3rd, 2020, but was extended to September 2nd to provide more time to tribes impacted by the pandemic. The commission received more than 400 applications which are now being evaluated and processed. 157 have already been accepted for filing. The commission has also granted um, special temporary authority, which allows temporary immediate use of spectrum in unique circumstances, such as natural disasters and, of course, pandemic. The spectrum provides additional capacity to meet increased demand for limited periods of time. To date, six tribal entities have received 2.5 STAs. I would note that STAs have also been granted in other bands, such as 700 megahertz, to providers serving tribal lands. The Rural Digital Opportunity Fund represents a $20 billion investment in high-speed broadband networks in rural America in two phases over 10 years under the Universal Service Fund High Cost Program that I mentioned briefly earlier. The reverse auction through which funding will be distributed is scheduled for next month. Speaking very broadly, a reverse auction is one where entities bid to provide the best service, meaning highest speeds and lowest latency at the lowest price. Several tribal entities have applied to participate in the RDOF auction. RDOF is the familiar acronym. The commission lowered the cost threshold to make more tribal lands eligible for bidding and increase the amount of support that can be made available for these areas. 
I also wanted to mention the 5G Fund Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. As the slide's title indicates, this rulemaking is still at the notice stage, but as proposed, of the $9 billion that will be available to bring 5G mobile broadband service to rural areas, $680 million would be specifically reserved for service to tribal lands. Again, this high-cost program funding would be allocated through a reverse auction. Switching to healthcare, the Commission created a new 200 million COVID-19 telehealth program to support healthcare providers responding to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. The Navajo Nation Department of Health was awarded just over $950,000 in May to provide home health care and remote monitoring services throughout the Navajo Nation to patients who are isolated and under shelter in place orders, including low income, elderly and vulnerable high risk patients. Also this spring, uh, the commission launched a connected care pilot program to provide up to 100 million in support from the Universal Service Fund for connected care and to help assess how the Universal Service Fund can be used in the long term to support telehealth. The program is open to tribal and other healthcare providers that provide services to tribal communities. In June 2020, the FCC streamlined the enrollment documentation required from Lifeline subscribers residing on tribal lands to allow for immediate activation of services while the sub subscriber submitted the required materials. This step helped Lifeline, tribal Lifeline subscribers, I'm sorry, uh, immediately access needed connectivity during the pandemic. In August, the commission extended the waivers which now run until the end of November. I believe we'll be taking questions after the next FCC presentation, but I encourage you to follow up with the Office of Native Affairs and Policy with any questions that you may have. We look forward to working with you in the future and hopefully meeting you in person when that is again possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. And you're right, it would be great to take questions um, after Jim's session as well. So please all feel free to put your questions in the chat now. And similarly to the last session or the last presentation, I'll read them out um, after Jim has had a chance to do his presentation. So with that, Jim, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, of course, the first step is uh, making sure we share the screen. Did I succeed? You'll have to tell me. Yes, you did. All right. Your screen sharing. I apologize. Within the FCC, we use Microsoft Teams uh, as opposed to Zoom, and so not everything. Uh, So of course everything's in a different place uh, with regard to this. So, um, and what I'm looking for is the place to move forward with regard to the next slide. You should be able to either just click in the center of the slide or use your arrow keys. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any RT, but <clears throat> well, we will start out and I will start clicking. Uh, and if it's not working, Katie, you can take over uh, for me. So I'm Jim Schlichting. <clears throat> I'm uh, in, in the International Bureau as well as uh, uh, working with Sayuri and ONAP with regard to the task force, Native Nations Task Force. I'm a senior deputy chief in the Bureau. I've been at the FCC for a number of years. Um, <clears throat> So what I'm going to do, which is a little bit different than uh, the first two presentations, uh, Katie thought it would be, and the society thought it would be helpful to do a bit of a, a bit of a change of pace with maybe, uh, maybe more of a focus on satellites and uh, uh, broadband uh, satellites that can provide broadband service. So what I'm going to do, the first part of the presentation are going to be talking about different satellite systems, <clears throat> and the last part. 
of the presentation, we'll be talking to some of the legalisms involved with how we uh, regulate satellites. I intend to spend more of the pre presentation on the first part of it uh, because I find that more interesting. Uh, and then the last part of it, um, I will try to go through relatively quickly. Um, but it's there as a reference point, both for folks who are looking at this and uh, will be available afterwards, obviously. So in any event, uh, here we go. <clears throat> so I thought I would start with the basics and sort of uh, under the FCC and I guess ITU, what is a satellite? Um, and this uh, definition is both incorporated by the FCC, but it also is based on ITU standards. And what I find very interesting is that, and does the cursor also show on my screen? I'm curious, because I have a cursor on the screen. Yes, it does. Oh, excellent. So <clears throat> it's sort of the troposphere, sort of six to 20 kilometers. Then you have weather balloons up to 50 kilometers, meteors. And then the aurora, which is perhaps uh, appropriate for some of the northern parts of the, the uh, of the areas we're talking about. And the Carmen line, and I don't know who or what Carmen is, but 80 to 90 kilometers. And then the International Space Station is uh, uh, approximately 400 kilometers above the Earth, and then the moon's way up there. But the, the 400 kilometers versus some of the satellites we're talking about um, should be um, sort of keep things in perspective. So here, here's just a basic satellite, an uh, anatomy slide of traditional satellites uh, that, uh, that Boeing had put out a few years ago with sort of the, yeah. this is just the basic hardware that has to be on the satellites, uh, including solar panels for energy, although there have to be fuel tanks, not everything is electric, uh, plus the antenna and a little bit of a, a rocket motor. Um, the useful light of the satellite but most satellites tend to be focused on uh, how much fuel is there in a satellite um, uh, because you can't you don't go up and refuel a satellite uh, with regard to those functions. There's also a wide variety of entities uh, or things that are satellites. The, the Boeing 702 satellite, that's more of the traditional satellite, very, very large, uh, a lot of fuel, 15 plus years uh, lifetime with the geostationary orbit. Uh, at the other extreme, we have the Planet Labs Dove satellite, which is very tiny, um, and it's anticipated low Earth orbit and a much smaller lifetime. Uh, this satellite doesn't provide broadband, um, in term, as opposed to sensing uh, information and data and the like. But uh, uh, again, this slide has indicated you know there's a wide diversity of what folks are willing to launch to do satellites, and then here's <clears throat> sort of the basic satellite network. Uh, with sort of an uplink from an earth station. You know, for instance, if you're providing internet, if you're providing video, you, you, know, you send information up to the satellite and then there's a downlink to whatever the earth station happens to be. And yeah, sometimes it's like a, a video earth station for direct TV or dish, um, but it could be you know, an earth station that's on a plane or a car uh, or a pretty old fashioned uh, handheld uh, and the like are more mobile uh, things. So um, again, basic structure of the network. Now types of orbits, um, well folks generally are focused on, well, the geostationary orbits, which is the widest one and the non the low earth orbit satellites. So you have the big one way out here in the low earth orbit. There also are medium earth orbit satellites and highly elliptical orbit satellites, uh, less common, but still exist. <laughs> and then the geostationary, you know, this is the basic uh, satellite that's been there since uh, ever in a day. Uh, and it's about 22,500 miles or 22,000 miles above the Earth. And of course, the big focus is uh, your period of the orbit is the period of the Earth's rotation. So it appears to be fixed in the sky. You know, pretty basic, but it's it's high up there. Uh, you can't get around that. Uh, and then the LEO or lower Earth orbit satellites, of which perhaps SpaceX and OneWeb are the most known names. Uh, you know, its altitudes are up to 2,000 kilometers. In other words, much, much less uh, than we're talking about uh, for geostationary. And then 
the orbital periods are much faster than the Earth's rotation um, because you got to have enough speed to stay in orbit as, a as opposed to falling back up to Earth, falling down to Earth. So satellite broadband, the geostationary orbit systems in the United States right now, they're two major uh, provider, broadband providers in the U.S. There's Viasat, who reports about 600,000 customers. Uh, it has taken advantage of universal service funding um, that the FCC has provided. Uh, in terms of satellites, um, just to give a context, uh, uh, Viasat has two satellites in or orbit with those amount of capacities, and they have uh, Viasat 3 is, is reported as scheduled for launch in the second half of 2021. Now, the coverage of geostationary is largely the contiguous U.S. and maybe the southern Alaska. Because once you get above a certain latitude, um, basically any dish trying to point at the Earth station over the equator is going to be pointed so low and have to go through so much atmosphere, it's, you don't get reliable coverage. And then Hughes is the other uh, provider of uh, satellite broadband in the U.S. from uh, geostationary uh, satellites. Uh, yeah, about twice the amount of uh, report, about twice the amount of customers in the U.S. Uh, they've also got uh, received some universal service funding, uh, and sort of again, they have two satellites up uh, in geostationary orbit, and they have a third one that's primed for launch in the second half of 2021. Um, so uh, that's what's providing uh, service today, and. Um, and what people, there's a lot more discussion about because it's a newer technology are the non-geostationary constellations uh, and where we stand uh, with prov provision of satellite broadband through these non-geostationary satellite constellations. Um, there's significant industry interest. Um, by definition, they are in lower Earth orbit and so the amount of time it takes to send a signal to and from the satellite uh, is much less. Uh, than with regard to the geostationary satellites. Uh, obviously, it's they're large constellations. You can't talk about two or three satellites to cover the U.S. You need many more satellites to cover the U.S. Uh, the FCC started licensing satellites, uh, non-geostationary satellites in this, in this era, uh, starting three years ago in 2017. Um, and the wide variety of companies uh, you know, some of them, just two satellites, uh, obviously don't provide as robust a service, and some license up to 4,000 satellites. Uh, seven of the 12 companies are focusing on broadband to the end user, as opposed to like Planet Labs, which discussed before, maybe remote sensing or uh, potentially providing services to uh, the folks other than uh, end user uh, consumers uh, with regard to that. Um, we license in three separate spectrum bands. Uh, they're subject to different technical rules and some different uh, licensing procedures and processes and the like. Um, you know, but for a person on the street, uh, the question of what service I'm getting, I'm not going to do, be too focused on, oh, am I getting KU band service or KA band service with regard to that. Um, when we've done the licensing, the FCC has emphasized you know, the importance that you know, the role that these satellites potentially can play in which we're hoping that they'll play and the launch deployment testing of some of the, of the first operational NGSO satellites have already begun, which makes it <clears throat> much more interesting than just a piece of paper that the FCC puts out to do a licensing. Uh, and the two big name systems that people hear most about are SpaceX's Starlink system, which we gave licenses in 2018 uh, and they've proposed basically you know 12 ultimately 12,000 licenses um, they're building and launching which perhaps everybody in the world knows its own satellites uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk are not exactly shy about hiding their uh, what they're doing and you know the way they do it they you know they send up a, a launch vehicle and they're launching 60 different satellites in one launch vehicle. Uh, at this point, they've launched over 700 satellites into space. Um, they've done some testing you know, where they report beta tests of speeds of over 100 megabits per second using standard user equipment and latency. 
far below 40 to 50 milliseconds round trip to the internet. But of course, these are beta tests and it's not a fully deployed network uh, with regard to that. Um, you know, my understanding is what SpaceX has said that uh, they feel they need about 800 satellites up there to begin offering a commercial service, even though that's not their sort of full game plan uh, and the like. And there's uh, some announcements that uh, Hopefully by the end of 2020, they might start providing service maybe in the northern U.S. and Canada. Um, the second major uh, NGSO system that people have been talking about for the last few years is OneWeb uh, or Worldview Satellite. And we granted their applications in 2017 and 2020. Uh, we've approved, uh, um, again, about 2,000 satellites for them. Uh, they have launched 74 satellites, uh, so they're not as far along as SpaceX. And uh, as some people may be aware that uh, OneWeb, and I believe it was earlier this year, did file for bankruptcy of the organization. Uh, but they've been, uh, uh, I guess the, uh, uh, there have, and I guess it's still sub coming out from Chapter 11 bankruptcy and the new ownership would include the UK government and India's Bharti Global Limited. Um, so, that, so they have, and I think their current discussions, uh, they're talking about resuming launches in December of this year, and they're talking about providing service about a year after uh, SpaceX and Starlink will be able to provide service. So this overview slide, and yes, the print is tiny, but you can use it elsewhere. But, but this is comparison. It talks in the right-hand column about licensing administration. And one of the interesting things, at least to me, is um, while we're talking about uh, satellite companies that have uh, access to the US market to provide broadband service to consumers, uh, only Kuiper from Amazon uh, Oh, well, and SpaceX, excuse me, SpaceX uh, is licensed through the U.S. For instance, Telesat Canada, surprise, surprise, the licensing administration is Canada. OneWeb went to the U.K. to get its license in dealing with the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, and Biosat uh, is, uh, is using the Netherlands. But if you look at the slides, this, this gives a nice overview of the number of satellites that I was talking about, like Space Norway, it's two satellites, and they're actually using uh, the the elliptical orbit. So it's it's yeah, you know, it has yeah, you know, it can be as far away as forty three thousand kilometers and as close as eight thousand kilometers. So they they have um, a, a goal of serving surprise surprise uh, very much the northern latitudes, and they're so they're focused not on so when it came to the U.S., they said, yes, we have plans to serve uh, Alaska. They weren't talking about serving uh, the continental U.S. So, and then again, what I told you, I did include some slides. One of the major things that I was going to highlight here is, yes, we do rulemakings for satellites and what rules of the road apply. Um, but a lot of the focus of how we uh, enable systems is through the licensing systems. And so we basically license at the FCC for a station in a specific orbit using specific frequencies. Uh, some interest to policy folks, uh, while I think people are aware that the, in the U.S. we generally auction terrestrial spectrum for commercial services and for broadcast services when licenses become available, there's actually a specific statute that uh, prevents the U.S from us uh, using auctions to s assign marketable locations uh, for satellite service. Um, the license term, 15 years, which tends to be on the broad, uh, the longer side, but that's, you know, it takes a while to put up satellites. Um, you know, the way we, I mean, we in essence have build out requirements that you have milestones to launch and operate once you have a system and you have bond requirements that you forfeit the bonds uh, if you fail to meet your markers. markers. And then we have to deal with technical requirements uh, to prevent interference. And then the last bullet I would point out is um, 
we do grant sort of market access permissions by non-US licensed services to access the US market and we treat them in the same way as we treat applications uh, for US licenses. It's not a license under US law, but they basically have the same rights uh, as folks that are US licensed. So with the US, when a UK administered satellite comes to the US wanting market access, it's actually not after a US satellite, um, excuse me, a US license, but it gives them the equivalent rights. And, the, and just as a matter of history, the GSOs, the licensing basis is under two different scenarios from the in GSO. The GSO, it's a bit of a first come first serve. Uh, there's not, you know, if you meet the specific requirements, um, you know, you can get your satellite license and get an orbital slot. Um, but you can't transfer or assign the license, which is very different than terrestrial uh, licenses that we give out. NGSOs is a bit different uh, in that we have processing rounds, which start with the first folks who want to uh, sort of provide an NGSO service. We open a window and they're competing applications. And again, we take, since we're not allowed to auction, we do basically grant all the licenses, but we do set up some ground rules for operators to coordinate amongst one another. And then we do also have milestones about what you have to do, how quickly in order to keep your license. Earth stations, um, you know, if it's a transmitting earth station, if you're actually transmitting on the airwaves, you have to be licensed. But there are a number of receive only earth stations in the US and you really don't need a license in order to receive um, but we do have registrations uh, available for receive only antennas. Um, and you know, so it's not nearly as complex as licensing a satellite system. Um, and the most amount of noise over earth station licensing has been in the question of the C band and the transition of satellite spectrum to terrestrial spectrum. So that's sort of the overview of from the US perspective of satellites, both in terms of what the systems are, where they stand. Uh, obviously, the companies are a better source of the most recent information, but uh, um, I thought that would be uh, much more helpful uh, to provide those sorts of information as opposed to walking through the details of uh, how the US does its licensing. So with that, I should stop my screen share, I think. Uh, oh, there we go. Red button. There we go. I turn it back on Katie. Thank you so much, Jim and Sayuri. That was really fantastic and appreciate all of that insight. We've got a bunch of questions in the chat um, and I'll read a couple of them out. And as a reminder to participants, please be sure to put any additional questions in the chat now. So to start, you have a question from Sally and from Chris asking, does I think actually what this is really asking is, could those low Earth orbit satellites work in more northern latitudes, north of 52 degree? And then in addition to that, do low Earth orbit satellites have the potential to cover all of the Earth? Well, as a matter of technology, I think the goal is to provide whole Earth coverage um, when you put the full system up uh, with regard to that. So the when you yeah, the question, and I think these folks do perceive, uh, as I mentioned with regard to SpaceX, uh, as far as their initial service offering, when they don't have their full capacity, uh, they're targeting uh, the northern US and Canada. I take that as an indication that they think that they're uh, the, the best place for them to provide, serv to provide service, at least initially, are in the northern latitudes uh, and the like. And I know when any of these systems have come before the US. Uh, that's one of the things they've talked about is the benefit. I mean, usually in the US, it's serving Alaska. I don't think they think we'll give them any credit for serving uh, the Yukon or the Northwest Territories, but, uh, um, but that's one of their sales uh, points when they uh, seek permission from the FCC to put forward their system. Um, but I do think it of interest, the fact that uh, what they've rep reportedly said publicly is that uh, when they do provide service, uh, they're, t they're targeting the more northern latitudes. Um, that's what I know on that. They Thank certainly you. don't have, they don't have the 
disadvantage of having satellites only over the equator. And they're trying to set up systems where a call is handed off between different satellites uh, on a real-time basis, um, which basically means wherever you are on the Earth, it all depends on where you put what orbits you put your uh, satellites in. Excellent, thank you. Then we've got another question from Agile. Um, do satellite providers have to get a license from the Spectrum Regulatory Agency in each country to be able to use a specific spectrum band there? Um, and does that mean, you know, if a LEO is providing full Earth, or full Earth orbit satellite, would they need to get licenses all over the all over the world? I think that would be a matter for the, the national regulator to decide. We grant access to the U.S. market, but we have no authority to grant access to the Canadian market. And so what a satellite provider wants to provide service uh, in Canada, um, yeah, I think they need to go to the Canadian regulator and whatever that regulatory scheme is. Thank you. And then similarly, so if a company asks the FCC for a license for satellite, does the, com does the public submit comments to the FCC to either support or oppose that license, or does that process happen outside of the public's purview? Uh, there is a public, uh, when we get those, um, when we get licensing, license applications for satellites, there is a public process. Uh, the applications are put out for public comment. Um, and anybody who wants to can file uh, in support or in opposition to any aspect of that. Um, I think as a factual matter, what tends to happen is that uh, different satellite companies file on uh, applications of other satellite companies with the very, very much the focus on being whether a new satellite system will create interference to the first satellites, you know, to the objecting satellite systems uh, network and the like. Uh, so that's what we tend to get uh, as opposed to uh, get comments from outside the industry. I think with regard to people supporting, uh, gee, we want more low Earth orbit satellites or things like that, I think people may file in the context of the uh, you know, universal service dockets uh, where, as I indicated, uh, satellite providers are eligible to come in and, and bid, um, you, know, it, you know, bid and get universal service funding. Um, also, to the extent that the FCC has ongoing proceedings about where we stand in uh, achievement of, of broadband universal service and how we should set the the bogeys for what the speeds ought to be and the like, um, people often come in and file in terms of um, what they, how the FCC should effect, uh, set up markers for broadband service. Um, and oftentimes it has implications for different technologies uh, in terms of what arguments are being made. So to the extent people are you know, filing in the context of we want more satellite or satellite isn't good enough, uh, I think they tend to be in those rulemaking proceedings as opposed to the, the licensing, as I was indicating in my slides. Yeah, the basic decision the FCC makes is whether a satellite applicant has met the requirements of the licensing regime. Um, we don't make judgment calls in terms of who's going to be better uh, than somebody else or the old comparative hearing me uh, mechanism. We look at such things as the, their technical requirements cause or don't cause interference? Do they have an adequate orbital debris plan so that when the satellite reaches the end of its useful life, um, will it be taken care of uh, as opposed to just floating forever in the day um, in sort of an orbit in which it could uh, potentially impact other satellites and the like? Although orbital debris is a much bigger proceeding than what we're issued than what we're talking about here. Thank you. And we've got time for one last question. Um, Chris Mitchell asks, is there a legal process to stop systems if they're found, satellite systems, if they're found to unacceptably cause problems with aesthetics or with astronomers? Um, is there a legal mechanism to remove them from orbit if there is some sort of an issue? I think that we have been considering those issues which have come up 
more recently in the context of some of these low earth orbit systems because you're talking about a lot more satellites. And I think that we've been focused on what sort of conditions do we place on licenses going forward uh, with regard to what should be sufficient or not sufficient with regard to that. Uh, you know, people have, people have filed raising those issues. Uh, the companies have responded and taking made efforts. Um, I'm not quite sure whether there's a legal me mechanism. I haven't thought about it um, as to whether if somebody, if system is, whether the, whether the FCC would basically tell uh, a company they had to deorbit a satellite. I, to be honest, I haven't heard that as being an issue under discussion as opposed to what conditions do we need to place? What additional actions do some of these companies need to do to, to deal with those sorts of issues? I mean, it is these, the astronomers have raised these issues, as I say, in the context of uh, low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and my understanding in particular is, although you don't think about it, you shoot up a satellite, it's not as though it instantaneously obtains an orbit and it may take uh, a number of days before it reaches its altitude. In the meantime, they're actually relatively low, so to speak, uh, to the Earth. But Thank you so much. All right, with that, we are right at time. So I wanna say a huge thank you again to all of our speakers today. We really appreciate you spending your time with us. And thank you so much to all of the participants who asked questions in the chat. Um, really appreciate your time as well. So that everyone is on the same page, in case you missed my spiel at the beginning, as a reminder, if you are watching these sessions after the fact, please let me know so I can count your participation. Next week's session also is gonna be at a different time than normal, so please be on the lookout for a calendar invitation. And if you have not yet signed up for the Indigenous Connectivity Summit, which kicks off next week, please be sure to do so. We're really looking forward to working with all of you then. Um, and as a reminder, our last session is building this year's policy recommendations. So come prepared with some thoughts about the direction you think we should take, how you wanna advocate in the year ahead, and how you wanna use this training moving forward. So that, thank you all again, appreciate it, and look forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.